of this series we discussed how silence of scripture doesn't authorize us to do something we cannot say well the bible did not say not to in order for us to do something and be right with god the reason is that we cannot know that god will accept whatever we do if we are appealing to what the scriptures don't say we discussed an example of a child going to the store, asked, get, given $20, and you, you're told to buy a loaf of bread, uh, a carton of milk, and, and a dozen eggs. The child comes and does every one of those things, and they get to the cashier's, the cashier, and in the line there is candy bars. And they say, well, mom and dad didn't tell me I can't have a candy bar, I think. I think I deserve one. I, I came to the store. Wasn't well, their money to spend. If they had their own money, they were old enough to have their own money and wanted to decide to spend it on a candy bar, well, that's their choice. But the $20 wasn't their money. They didn't have authority for it. Just because their parents didn't say, don't do this, doesn't mean that they had the authority. Parents don't have to say, don't, don't buy this, 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 and this, but buy these three things. You don't have to list every item in the grocery store. We understand that principle. Well, the scriptures are not ours. God revealed his mind to us. We don't get to change it just because we want to. So if we can't use the silence of scripture to establish authority for our, the practices and the way we live our lives, how do we establish authority? The sermon is going to be broken up into two different sermons. We're going to discuss, in general, how we establish authority in this lesson. And then we're going to look at some specific cases in the next lesson in the series, Lord willing, next month. So, how do we establish scriptural authority? Well, the first thing we need to recognize is that we establish authority by looking to the scripture for a command of God or a statement of God I want you to do this. So in other words, we look for places where God commands us to do things. And so a statement or a command is where God, through the scriptures, tells us directly to do something. An example is talking about repentance and baptism as necessary for salvation. Acts 2.38 said, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is a statement or a command of the Lord that in order for you to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, something we talked about a couple weeks ago, was salvation, not the gift of speaking in tongues, for not every Christian received that gift. If you wanted to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, salvation, you had to repent of your sins and be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of your sins. Other passages would say, I need to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Yes, we recognize that we have a whole approach to Scripture. We can't just pick and choose which verse. But Acts 2.38, we need to recognize, is a command of God. It's not an example of someone doing it. It's not anything else. It is a command. Repent and be baptized. Well, we just gave of our means. Bill, Bill let us in some thoughts just before uh, we did so. Why did he do that? Why does the church take up a collection on the first day of the week? Why don't we do so on Monday? Why don't we do so on Tuesday or Thursday or Friday? Or why don't we do this just some days? Why is it the first day of the week? Well, if we go to 1 Corinthians 16, in verses 1 and 2, we read, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must also do. On the first day of the week, 
Let every one of you lay by, lay something aside, storing up as you may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Note here that one of the works of the church was for the benevolence of needy saints. We will discuss that a little bit more in a future lesson. But that was one of the works of the church. And so when the church did this, when they took a, when they were helping out needy saints, they took up a collection. And they did so on the first day of the week. Now, yes, we understand that there is more work than just benevolence for needy saints. We recognize that there's more work of the church. How does the church collect money for that? Well, we find no other way in Scripture that they did that. We know that there was a work, and we know that the church collected money on the first day of the week for the benevolence of needy saints. So, since we find no other place where the church took up a collection in any other way, then we can infer from that that when the church has a work to do, and it is collecting from the members of the congregation, it does so on the first day of the week. We all come together, and it, it makes sense as to why it's the first day of the week. We come together on the first day of the week to worship God, to remember Jesus around the Lord's table. We are together. It is the work of the church. And so it is only fitting, in one sense, that it is the first day of the week. But we can't appeal to silence of Scripture and say, well, it didn't say don't don't take up a collection on Monday. It didn't say don't take up a collection on Wednesday. What's the difference? The difference is I have authority for one, and I don't for the other because I cannot appeal to silence. This was a command. Take up a contribution on the first day of the week. Why does this church eat of the Lord's Supper? Where, where's the command for that? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 29, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and, uh, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats, of this, eats this bread or drinks of this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Well, the Corinthians had a problem when it came to the Lord's Supper. In that they were not using it as a means of remembering the Lord's body and blood. They were using it as a means to satisfy the hunger of the flesh. If they met in the morning, it was lunch. If they met in the evening, it was dinner. Paul said that's not the purpose of the Lord's Supper. The, Lord, the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of the body and blood of Jesus. It is a command to partake. The, the, the Corinthian church was observing the Lord's Supper in the sense that they were observing it. They just were observing it incorrectly because they had been given commands. They had been shown by Paul what you need to do. You need to partake of the Lord's Supper. Well, what, what, what was part of the Lord's Supper? What was the Lord's Supper? Well, we're told that Jesus took bread to remember his body. And we know it is unleavened bread because Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper at Passover. And since he instituted it at Passover, there was no leavening in the house. We, you, you might read 1 Corinthians, it just says bread. Can I take sourdough bread? Can't I take short bread as far as if it, like as far as, it, it, it's just generic. But Jesus took unleavened bread. We know he took 
unleavened bread. So that's the bread that represents his body. Unleavening in scripture often has to do with sin. With blemish. Jesus' body and blood was unblemished. And so it's fitting Jesus used unleavened bread. We follow the example that Jesus used unleavened bread. But we know that the Lord's Supper consisted of bread. An unleavened bread. And so we're told to, to remember the Lord's body. We do so through the unleavened bread. We're also told that Jesus took the fruit of the vine. Now, we know he took grape juice. That's what fruit of the vine means in scripture. We know he took grape juice for the same reason we know he took unleavened bread. Because it was the Passover. Anything with leavening, and alcohol has it. Yeast is made in the leavening process. Or, uh, uh, that, that's how things leaven. Whether it's natural leaven or not. Jesus would have used grape juice. And so, to remember the blood that he shed on the cross for the new covenant, which is for the forgiveness of sins, we're told to take the fruit of the vine. We do not take tomato juice, which grows on a vine, or any other fruit that grows on a vine. It's grape juice in scripture. We can know that it's grape juice. And so that's what we use. Because we are commanded to remember the body of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ. We're also commanded to partake in a worthy manner or worthily, depending on if you have an older version. A lot of people say, well, what does that mean? Does it mean I have to be worthy in order to approach Christ? Well, if we're waiting for that, we're going to be waiting a long time. Because Christ died for my sin. I'm not worthy without Christ to stand before God at all. Worthy manner or worthily in the older versions means with the correct attitude. Actually remembering the body and blood of the Lord and giving reverence to Christ. So when we partake, it is it is remembering. It's not going and taking a piece of bread and then considering today's Super Bowl Sunday. Well, I wonder who's going to win the game today. Or I'm, I'm focusing on some problem, some issue I'm going to have to face this afternoon. No, we, we center our minds around what Christ did for us. It's an attitude, a mindset. And that's what the Corinthians were not doing. They were just eating and drinking as if it was just some regular meal that we might have if we go out to lunch or dinner. It's not that. It's a remembrance. We are commanded to do those things. We are commanded to eat of the Lord's Supper, and we are commanded to eat of it in a certain way. What about assembly? Why do we gather on Sunday? Is there a command that we have to assemble as a church? So let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as we see the day approaching. The church is commanded to assemble. And as members of a church, we are not to forsake the assembly. Meaning that if we are able to be here, we are to be here. We're not to, tr and we're not to, uh, to, uh, try, well, sorry, and we're not to try uh, to place stumbling blocks in front of ourselves so that we are not here. Uh, it is, uh, people say, well, I have to work on Sunday, and that might be. There are some jobs that you say, well, I might have to miss a Sunday here or there. They'd be here if they can, but we should not be placing stumbling blocks in front of ourselves in order to intentionally miss the worship of the church. We should want to be here when the church meets. Every time the church meets. When we meet on Sunday, we'll be here. It should be very strange that we're not. If we're sick, obviously, we're not forsaking the assembling our, ourselves together. If we're sick or we're injured because we can't make it here. But that's the ex that's really goes into forsaking. Forsaking is not desiring to come together at all. It, again, is an attitude problem. But here we're told the assembly of the church 
is to come together. And we come together, we see it in Scripture on the first day of the week. We can come together on any day of the week. We see that in Scripture too. But we do come together on the first day of the week. But I do like to note as we pass by, the assembly of the church is when the church gathers together in one place. Because remember, the church is the collection of people. I am not the church. <coughs> Gord is not the church. Even Gord, Calla, and me are not the church. Just because Christians gather together doesn't mean that the church gathers together. The church, this group of called out people, when we gather together, we have decided to gather together for that purpose. And that is important for us to know. When we come together at 10 o'clock, we could decide to come together as a church to study the Bible. We could do that. But what would be the difference between that and what we do do at 10 o'clock? We would not separate into other Bible classes. Because the church is gathered together in one place. We see that in 1 Corinthians 10 and 1 Corinthians 11. That you are gathered in one place. That is the church. When we decide to separate into different classes, that's Christians gathering together to study scripture. Whether we use this building or my house or Gord's house or John's house or anyone else's house, even if we all just gather at Tim's house, we say, well, they're doing construction on the building t today. We can gather at Tim's house. We can gather at Tim's house for the church, and that'd be the church. And we can gather at Tim's house on another day of the week, and it should be Bible study. The difference is the purpose, the reason you come together. And when the church comes together, yes, maybe the women wouldn't be speaking, just as it is now. But in Bible class, when Christians gather together, women can comment and, and read just like in any Bible class. It doesn't matter whether it's public or private. The women won't lead, but they can participate just as in any Bible class. So the assembly has nothing to do with the place that we assemble. It has everything to do with the determination of why we come together. And during that assembly, God has given us certain commands as to what is to take place and who leads in such instances, when the church isn't assembled, other instructions would would apply. And so let's let's keep that in mind when it comes to it's it was one of the things we don't often consider. And since we don't really talk about it that much, it's very easy to get confused. You go to our website and you stop on the one slide that's at the top of the screen, you'll notice that there is specific language that I've put on. The East End Church of Christ meets at 11 a.m. for assembled worship. And then underneath it, Christians meet together at 10 a.m. for Bible study on Sunday and 7 o'clock for Wednesday evening Bible study. It's not wrong if the sign says the church meets at 10 for Bible study and 11. I'm not saying that. But I, we are making the distinction so that people understand that there is a difference. Because sometimes we can just think, okay, Worship is the church, Bible study is not the church, and that's not really true. It has everything to do with why we've assembled and for what purpose. So that's commands. We establish scriptural authority by statements or commands. But we can also establish authority by approved examples. And this is where God, through the scriptures, shows us what he desires to be done. And so, coming back to the example of the Lord's Supper, why do we partake of it on Sunday alone? If you go to a Catholic church, they have the Eucharist, which is what we call the Lord's Supper, on every time they meet. If they meet on Monday, they'd have it. Meet on Wednesday, they'd have it. Meet on Saturday, they'd have it. And they'd have it on Sunday today as well. They come along and say, well, we're meeting, so we're going to have the Lord's Supper. And if we didn't have this verse on the, on the board, 
I couldn't say yes or no that that's right or wrong. Because 1 Corinthians 11, that command, said as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he comes. And so I couldn't say, I couldn't argue, well, why don't we partake of it on Monday or, or Friday or whenever we meet? Why don't we do that? We come together as the church. Why is it, why would that be a problem? And it is because Acts 20 and verse 7 says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his speech till midnight. This is an example of the early church fulfilling God's command of partaking the Lord's Supper. The breaking of bread in that chapter, it, it, that phrase can mean the Lord's Supper, it can mean a common meal, but in this context, the church was the one that was gathering together to break bread. They were gathering together to eat of the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 10, talking about the Lord's Supper, uses the same type of language. And so, this shows us that the Lord's Supper was taken when the church was assembled, so it's not each and every one of us on our own, we can get that from 1 Corinthians 11 as well. But it also shows us when Christians did this. They did this on Sunday. They did this on the first day of the week. Without this example, as I said, we would have the command, but not a command or example of when to eat. Giving That would give us the liberty to choose when to eat. However, we do have this verse. We do need to pay attention to this verse. We do need to come along and say that this is an example. And it's the only example of which day the Christians partook of the Lord's Supper. Even though we know Christians gathered together on other days of the week. So what? This example restricts our partaking of the Lord's Supper. Why? Because silence doesn't authorize. We know God has revealed to us that eating of the Lord's Supper on Sunday is what Christians did. That's approved. If I want to venture in and eat on other days, that's, I can't say, is approved. Can't find a command, and I can't find an example for it. So, eating the Lord's Supper on Sunday, that's an example. We find authority for that through example. What about what we've been talking today in our opening, in our Bible study class, about elders. Where does the scripture say, or where does the scriptures tell us, that a church, if it's going to have elders, has to have more than one? Well, if we go to Philippians chapter 1, and in verse 1, we read, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops, who would be elders, and deacons. We see here that the church in Philippi had multiple elders. There isn't a command in 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1 for a plurality of elders. There isn't that command. We can't say there is because there isn't. But we never read of a church in the New Testament having just one. We never see that. In Acts 20, when we see the Ephesian elders, more than one. When Paul and Barnabas set out elders in every church, always more than one. Philippi, more than one. That's our example. More than one. In fact, this was one of the first divergences that faithful churches began to engage in. If you read some of the quote-unquote church fathers, once you get into the second century, after the apostles had died, you start reading of churches with one bishop. What are the problems of having just one bishop? Well, it's the same problems that this church lets me rule it as a pastor. I'm one person. I can make mistakes. I can lord it over people. I can be seen as almost like a king or a dictator. Elders are meant to serve. That doesn't mean one person can't serve. But it's always better to have more than one person serve. And so perhaps that is why. I have to say perhaps, because I don't know specifically. 
But perhaps that is why God said, gives us the example of multiple elders. So that being an elder is a big job. It, it's not just a Sunday morning job. It's a huge job. So having more can spread out the work. You can do better. But it also allows the church not to be steered in one direction or the other away from the truth. Having one bishop, we saw where that led. That led to the Roman Catholic Church, which is not the Church of Christ. It is not the Church of God, because it's gone so far off in error. Denominations do the same thing today, because they are led by one person. That's the danger of doing that. And so, why do we? Ha why, where do we get the idea that we need multiple elders? From the examples found in Scripture. So we find we have, we have authority from a statement of command and approved example. Lastly, for today's lesson, we also we also establish authority through what is called a necessary inference. Now we don't often use that term today, and so I'd like to sort of put it in terms that we would understand. This is where God, through scriptures, implies what needs to be done. And the implication that we draw must be unavoidable. In other words, it can be the only implication that can be drawn. If we wake up, if all our snow were to melt, which this week it might, I hear it's supposed to be quite warm this week, if all our snow were to melt, and then we wake up next week, and there was snow on the ground, what could you imply from that? That it snowed last night. Is that the only thing that you can draw from that? Yes. You didn't see the snow. It's not snowing when you woke up. But there's snow on the ground now. Well, snow, snow when I went to bed. Snow on the ground now. It must have snowed. snowed. And so... That's the type of inference that we're talking about. It is an unavoidable inference. Just because I can imply something from Scripture doesn't mean it's the only implication I can draw. And if it is not the only one, it's not going to authorize me to do anything because I won't know. But if it is the only one, then I can know. So what are maybe some examples of this in Scripture? Well, Remember we read from Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 earlier, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. We said God is commanding us to assemble. Well, the only conclusion you can draw from that is we need a place to assemble. If we are commanded to assemble, we have to have a place to do that. And so if the church is to assemble, and we can't find a command or an example of just one place where the church does, and we don't, we find the church meeting in many different places, then each church is going to have to decide where to assemble. We assemble here at 3850 Finch Avenue East in Toronto. We don't have to assemble here. If we were a smaller group, we may rent a smaller facility, or we might have to meet in someone's house if we were a small enough group, because we couldn't afford to rent a place. Is it wrong to meet in someone's house? No. It's a place to meet. We would have to tell people, all right, we're meeting at Gord's house. And Gord's surprised that we are, but, uh, but, but uh, well, we'll meet at Gord's house. That's not wrong, if that's where this church decides to assemble. But the inference from Hebrews 10 is you have to have a place to assemble. So that would provide us, since there's no command or example that there is a specific place God wants us to assemble, that would give authority for the church to purchase a building, if it is able to do that, rent a place, or find a place that is suitable for its needs. It does. It shouldn't give us the, the authority to waste money. I've seen some of these buildings that churches build, and they are such grand structures of architecture. They look very pretty, but I'm sitting here going, what a waste. The building is not the important thing. 
as to what it looks like, our room is not spectacular to look at. It really is not. But it suits our needs. We can meet here. And we can be fine. Are there problems with this building? Absolutely. There's going to be problems in any place we rent. But it's a place to meet. We can afford it. It is able for people to get here. And so this is what we have chosen. Other places might choose a different path. But also, another, another example is a church existing without elders. We talked about a church having a plurality of elders. But where, where, where do we get this idea that a church can exist without elders? Well, it is necessarily implied, necessarily implied by the qualifications of elders itself. In Titus chapter 1, in verses 5 to 9, since we were dealing with Timothy this morning, I'll read from Titus. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should have set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he's been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Were there churches in Crete when Paul wrote to Titus? Yes, there were. Did they have elders? No, they didn't. A church can exist without elders. It is lacking according to Titus 1 verse 5. But if you have qualifications for elders, that must mean that in order to have elders, men must meet those qualifications. What happens if they don't? You don't have elders. There's no command in Scripture or example of, in Scripture of one or the other. We usually read of churches with elders, but we do read of churches without elders. It is ne the necessary implication from just the qualifications themselves is that churches who don't have men who qualify can still exist. The church is lacking, but it is still a church that can function. This arrangement is under the guidance of faithful men. Because remember, men are leading the congregation, whether it is in worship or otherwise. We never read of women leading the congregation. However, in a church without elders, women are not excluded from the work of the church. We'll deal with that this year as well. But they don't hold the leadership role. Are the men infallible by, doing, by, by running this? No. In fact, it's a pretty precarious situation because in a church without elders, what does that mean? That means that the men in some way, shape, or form are immature in one of the qualifications or more of eldership. Does not mean they're sinful? It means they're a little bit more immature. And so when you have in that situation, it can lead, if we're not careful, to making decisions that are not scriptural. Because there's a reason for these qualifications for elders. It is to shepherd the flock. This is what God has determined makes good shepherds. We as a congregation should be desiring to have elders. And the man here should be seeking to become qualified to be elders, if it is all possible to be qualified, so that we are not lacking. But the implication of qualifications necessarily is that there might be churches that don't have elders. And so those, those are some, there are many different types of examples that I could use. I picked elders because we don't often cover that one. We usually, we usually cover some of the more famous examples, and that can lead us into thinking, well, those are the only examples. And so those are necessary inferences. Just before closing, though, when it comes to necessary inferences, we must ensure that they are indeed necessary. For I can infer a lot of things from Scripture that might not be necessary. For instance, I could draw the inference from 1 Corinthians 11.26 that the word often, when it comes to partaking the Lord's Supper, provides authority for taking the Lord's Supper on any day of the week, or only at certain times of the year. 
it's not a necessary implication because other scriptures have something to say on that. I could imply it, but it's not necessary. I could say that Romans 16, I could say that Romans 16 verse 1 implies that women can be deacons because Phoebe is called a deacon or a servant there. It's not a necessary implication because all Christians are servants, but the office of a deacon, according to 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13, is restricted to men. So I can't use Romans 16, verse 1, and say, well, that is implied she was called a deacon. He was called a servant, just like every Christian is a servant. I could also say from 2 Corinthians 9, 13, which uses the phrase all men in the context of giving the church helping all men, that that implies that the church can be involved in helping the needy of this world in addition to needy Christians. Don't believe me? People do that all the time. That's one of people's favorite verses to try to authorize the church helping those who are in need that are not Christians. Why is that not a necessary conclusion? It's because the assumption is made that all men means even non-Christians. And what you really need to know is that that phrase, all men, is often used restrictively. But the word men isn't in that verse. It's italicized if it's there. All men is not, men is not in that verse. It is added uh, by translators where the Greek says all. You, you, you must, in the context of being, you were liberal to all. And so to assume that Paul meant non-Christians here, as included in all, is speculative. For he could have been making the distinction between the Corinthians' specific giving to the Judean brethren, which is what was specifically being talked about, and then to all Christians elsewhere. That is a conclusion I can draw. And so if I can't draw one and only one conclusion, I can't make that a necessary inference for authority. We read in Scripture that giving by the church is restricted to needy saints. We're going to discuss that in a future lesson on benevolence. But it is restricted to needy saints. That does not release Christians from helping the needy of this world. We are to do that and to do that liberally. The church cannot be involved in that. We must. And so let's be involved in that. Let's not come and think, well, if the church can't do it, I can't do it. No. That's not true. Sort of like saying these charities out there, well, if these charities can't help them, then I can't help them either. We don't do that with regular charities. Why do we do that with the church? So in conclusion, how do we establish scriptural authority? We've looked at the Bible. We don't look to our own opinions. We find places where God commands us to do something. God shows us to do something, or God implies for us to do something. If we find those things, we have authority. And that is what the church is to do. We are not to stray into our own opinions. Like, well, I think God would accept this. It doesn't matter what I think. What does God think? I should be able to turn to a passage... Uh, read it properly in its context and come away knowing what God thinks. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Let's accept that. That he has given us all things. The Bible teaches us how to be saved. The Bible says we need to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. That he died for our sins on the cross and was raised the third day. As a consequence of that, we need to respond to the gospel by repenting of our sins and confessing our faith and being baptized for the remission of our sins. If we have not done that, today is the day of salvation. We need to do that to be saved today. If you have not done that, you can do that today. I am not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to him.